And we are live on the Two Turtle Tom show every uh, every Thursday night at 8 p.m. We talk turtles, uh, whether it's their captive care or turtle conservation, tortoises. We will talk about it. And tonight we have Aaron Johnson with us. Aaron is a superb tortoise keeper. And we are going to have an in-depth discussion about the Bell's Hingeback Tortoise. Um, and we are also going to talk about um, a pathogen that we think is infecting these tortoises. And we're also going to talk about some fun things that Aaron has going on uh, also in the tortoise world. So, Aaron, welcome. How are you? Thanks, Tom. Doing good. Doing awesome. well. Awesome. Enjoying a little bit of spring weather. Yeah, it was in the 70s here on Monday and Tuesday. So we'll take it. <laughs> That's rare yeah, for we're, us. We're, we're getting some rain, which actually we do need. So uh, that's uh, good for us too. Yeah, being in the Midwest, yeah, uh, 70s at this time of the year is pretty exciting. It's, it's not common. Uh, so um, let's go to the chat and say hello. Um, we've got Alan Newberry uh, of Forged in Fire fame, but also works with several species of tortoises, including hinchbacks. Uh, Sebastian's with us. Uh, my my buddy Jack from he's from Indiana. Patrick Lee is here. Mike Chan from CNC Tortoises in West Coleman. If you are here, uh, please introduce yourself. Uh, we do this every Thursday night, and uh, welcome to the community. Uh, please take time to uh, say hi, and we will shout you out. And let's get started, Aaron. Aaron, uh, tell us a little bit about your entry into the world of hingeback tortoises. What made you decide to work with a hingeback tortoise species? I think the first time that I ever saw a hingeback tortoise was from this book. Oh. Um, I, I guess I got it when I was eighth grade, something like that. And I came across this um, Conixie's Homiana with a yeah nice yellow head. Yellow head. And, um, but at the time period, I was most uh, fascinated, like I think most people are. Uh, you know, with, with, uh, Geo Chul yeah. yeah, yeah, with the stars, yeah. but I always kept them in the back of my mind. And as I was researching later on, um, by this time I already had star tortoises and Chaco tortoises. I had seen that, um, I knew of like the Belliana complex, the Bell's Hingeback complex at the time period. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I I was looking at the Western hinge back at the time, but I also saw that there was something that was probably what became the true Bell's hinge back. And I was always curious about it and hoping that one day you might be able to find in the United States. And um, finally, I, th I think finally I evolved to see like Speaks hinge back. And uh, I really wanted to get some of those back already in 2012 2015 time period i think yeah, yeah. uh i always resisted i just kept with the two species i was working with and then finally um man was i guess it was september of 2021 i bought um a, a trio of captive bred speaks hingebacks from jeremy thompson and uh i loved them they were exactly what i thought they would probably be just these uh, really fun outgoing tortoises that you could feed worms to and they would just, you know, eat the eat the worm directly from my hand, like, you, you know, completely tame. Also, they would bite my fingers if I wasn't careful. So uh, mm -hmm. you have to watch out for that. But uh, yeah, and then um, around the same time period in 2021, I became fully aware of the mislabeled speak hingebacks and the mislabeled zombensis hingebacks uh or the eastern hingeback um being sold which were actually the connexies belliana the true bells hingeback 
um, but being sold online under different names. And I started also learning that people were uh, having them die like flies. And um, so I thought, okay, this is actually a target species I was aware of before it actually became its own scientific species. Um, I would really like to get into this, but I'm going to try to be as cautious as possible and find animals that have been in the United States for at least six to 12 months. Hopefully those guy, those animals will be healthier or be, uh, you know, somehow or another more stabilized. Um, and if something does happen with them, then maybe their good health for six to 12 months might carry over and they might be able to be treated fine with not just being fresh imports. Long story short, that happened and it didn't happen because some of the long-term long -term captives still came down with um, what we identified as kink or uh, turtle intranuclear coccidiosis. And, um, and it, it, took, it took several months to get that diagnosis, but finally after um, several tortoises dying, I was able to send in a male into the University of Florida and both with uh, uh, cute, uh, quantitative PCR testing, uh, testing for the DNA of the pathogen and also a necropsy actually going in, looking under the scope, um, taking samples and um, Dr. Osaboff or, or as he goes by Oz, um, they were able to determine, uh, yeah, indeed, the turtle, the tortoise had tink. And um, likewise, from that, it was cons all the other tortoises that I had that died or were currently dying were consistent with the same pathogen. So, um, but on the other hand, I had a pair at that time period, which I still have now, that showed no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, just you got them and they act just like these normal healthy animals that you wouldn't even know that they were wild caught. You, you might as well think that they're captive bred or that they've been housed in captivity for 10 or 20 years. Um, tame, outgoing, eating everything you give them from, from earthworms to mushrooms, uh, greens, a uh, little bit of fruit here or there, some mixed vegetables, everything like that. So you have this one group that uh, is deathly ill and dying on you and you have to figure out really quickly, how am I gonna treat this to try to prevent them from all dying, which that group did all ultimately die. Uh, I think that was five total, despite some of them going through a year long treatment. Another group that was a pair that was showing more intermediate signs, um, lethargy, every so often eating, every so often not eating, um, eye matter, um, j just really uh, up, up and down, up and down. I was like, okay, this one, they have it. It's just a matter of time. Um, and then of course the other group, perfect. No, nothing going on at all. Um, just per perfectly healthy, which um, the, then this uh, last spring or this last fall, uh, September of 2023, I was able to get um, a clutch of eggs and then a subsequent clutch of eggs in October. So three different groups purchased around the same time period. Uh, all three of the groups had been in the United States for six to 12 months, totally different results. And that all pretty much depended on whether the, the animals had tink or how active tink was and how probably invasive it was within the body. Uh, so, wow. um, but every, every group I had kept isolated, kept isolated from each other and I kept isolated from all of my other animals. I gloved up from the start. Um, you, you know, I, I took, I took, um, I kind of try to treat it as if it could be airborne, even though I knew it probably wasn't sure. unless it was going to be like ranavirus or something like that. And 
then you you know you you might have a risk of it getting aerosolized if if uh, getting actually in the air uh, through certain mechanisms, but probably still unlikely. Mostly, it's touching a surface and and then touching your animals or touching another another surface. Um, yeah. But anyway, um, it it did end up being uh, tink and uh, which is a fecal oral. From from what everybody can understand, it pro mm -hmm. very much likely should be ninety nine to one hundred percent of the time a fecal oral thing. So as long as you keep animals out of splash zones and uh, making sure your hands are clean or always are gloving up every time, can't make any mistakes. You have to be perfect on this. Um, Absolutely. Because if, if if you get a smear of poo on your hand and yeah. introduce it to uh to a water or a food source or something like that then there might be enough pathogen on that to transfer it so yeah um, totally yeah and and the the uh sporulated oocysts are yeah, incredibly yeah. hard to kill right like yeah. hydrogen peroxide it kills them but bleach won't damage the cyst from what i've read even even I, I don't feel secure with any type of sterilizing chemical to actually kill it because um, there's a possibility that the, the, a certain type of peroxide, a higher concentration of peroxide might be able to kill them, uh, destroy it pretty rapidly. The other one is high, uh, um, uh, what, what's, it, what's it called? Um, uh, all of a sudden lost uh, the, the name of the chemical uh hydrogen ammonia, peroxide? Um, oh, hi, oh, ammonia, ammonia. Uh, yeah uh, uh, ammonia hydroxide or uh, mm. whatever the the chemical name is that's another one where it um that it's long known with other types of intranuclear coccidiosis that if you have it in in the wet form wherever it has spread, like say a chicken coop or something like that, or, or, or even where the dog kennels are, especially if you have like, say a concrete floor or something, you scrub it all with soap and water, and then you put the, the uh, ammonia on it, which is really toxic. So you have to, you know, get out of there. You can't have the animals in there. Um, but after maybe an hour or so, it will neutralize the oasis. Um, wow. But that that isn't very um, practical. Um, no. So so I, I, I'm um, zoological setting, not not at all practical. Um, Even in a zoological setting, not very practical. Um, so like, hey, I, we're gonna I, have toxic yeah. ammonia fumes in the house now, family. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So what what then, do we and, need? And then if you accidentally uh, mix in some bleach in it, then uh, oh. you know you you really can die. And absolutely well let's let's reset a little bit we'll, we'll welcome some new folks uh brian selvik's joined us uh stephen porterala is here tanner jones uh or uh, tanner let me know if that's how you pronounce your last name and ichiro who is from hawaii and works with redfoots and some other species so tanner is is one of the people that uh was raising up some of these animals that uh you now work with um, so Aaron, w one of my big questions for you is why did it take us so long to put tink, the label tink, and that these things have tink on these animals? Because other people tested them for tink and, and they weren't coming back positive. And so for a long time, we were saying things like, we don't know what's going on I, I was confused and a lot of us were, were confused but you seem to be the person work, working with your vet to really pin it down on tink and and I'm, I'm curious what or how did you look at the problem differently perhaps than than people before you and and how were you able to pin it down that yes this is tink we're dealing with here yeah, um, I guess this would be May of 2022. Um, at that time period, I was tr actively treating the male that subsequently got tested positive for tink. 
And at that time, I was uh, treating him with, uh, under my local veterinarian with septazidime or Fortaz. And, and antibiotic. Yeah, an antibiotic that uh, is overall pretty gentle and pretty effective on a lot of micro, uh, a lot of bacteria, uh, but with some limitations. And I noticed that the animal seemed to, some of his respiratory uh, conditions that he were going on at the time kind of improved, maybe, but it, it was something where, it, you know, am I seeing something or am I just wanting to see this? Um, and, but so I started, I did kind of think at the time, I was like, okay, I'm wondering if this antibiotic is actually being able to take care of part of the problem that, you know, like say a bacterium that takes over due to something else in the background, whether it's a viral or a parasitic issue. Um, but by the time we went completely through the medication and he still died, uh, despite even giving him, um, uh, you know, injections of, of, um, of, of, of water basically and everything like that. He still died. Um, he had the um, plaque in the mouth, um, which made me think, you know, could he have Rana virus? Could he have herpes virus? Um, or, or could he potentially have tink in that case? I knew it had to be something significant uh, since uh, he, he ultimately died and went with that. So, um, I, I knew that he needed to one, get a, uh, diagnosis, uh, with, you know, with a molecular diagnosis with DNA, you know, like a, uh, uh, with a, a PCR, but I also wanted him to get the necropsy and mm -hmm. I wanted him yeah, to go to, um, well, I, I spoke on the phone with Oz at the time, Dr. Osiboff. Um, I'm, I might be mispronouncing his name. Oh, Osiboff or Osiboff. Yeah, the University, University of Florida. Florida. Yep. Yeah, and I'll refer to him as Oz. That's what he usually goes by. Spoke to him on the phone, and he 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 was wonderful. He uh, explained lot every question that I had, you know, to the best of his understanding, and um, he walked me through how to, you know, send in the animal and uh, get it down there overnight to University of Florida, and we did that. Um, he got me preliminary emails. He was always in touch with me. Um, so it was a really good, uh, thorough experience, both as a, um, you know, as a, a customer bringing in their, their deceased animal, but also academically and scientifically, because he, you know, uh, he, he was giving me the actual details, uh, that I needed, that I needed for my own ed edification to understand what might be going on. And, um, you know, things worked out right with this particular animal. The disease was advanced enough where he was able to, I'm, I'm thinking it was actually with a kidney sample that he was actually able to get the uh, PCR testing from. He took the biopsy of the kidney, um, mm. if I remember right. And then he was able to get the, 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 the confirmation. Um, but you'll also a lot of times find in the pancreas as well as well as some other organs um really any any organ potentially could be infected by it but will you will there be enough copies of the pathogen in that organ tissue um that that's one question because okay. although P pcr is very very sensitive you still have to have the right amount of copies in it um and you don't want your um you don't want your test to be too dilute either. That's another issue. It's like, say, say you pull numerous copies from numerous animals together. Um, they usually recommend about only two animal samples per vial that you're sending in uh, to help uh, make it where you're really able to look at the, the sample without it getting diluted. Um, so in this case, it was just one animal. Uh, the, the PCR worked flawlessly. And in addition to that, he was able to actually look at the, um, the organs and, and the, the cells and be able to see that, oh yeah, we actually are having intranuclear coccidiosis um, disrupting the actual tissues. So you were able to get um, that uh, proof in two different ways. But um, 
I don't know why somebody, why say an animal that is extremely sick and obviously probably should have the it through all of its tissues. Mm-hmm. I don't know why um, you might not be able to find it in, in that case, because logically you would think you would be yeah. able to find it. Well, um, it, 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 it makes some sense that having the carcass of the animal sent there, they were relying on more than just a swab. Mm-hmm. They, they could and, test and fact, the organs. In the, fact, it, the carcass was the first thing he looked at it. They looked at it and they said, this doesn't look viral to me this looks like it's parasitic and this is actually a surprise to me i didn't think it was going to be parasitic we thought that it was going to be viral yeah we thought it was Um, some strange unknown virus or something that's really what we thought yeah because a lot of the tink tests had come back negative like i think all the tests done by various people wow so and and it still blows my mind that they they that they uh you know, came back negative just because, um, and and there there could be numerous reasons for that. the 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 one reason that always stands out to me is that potentially there just wasn't enough in that tissue, or it wasn't in that tissue, or maybe there was a sample error. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. it it could happen. Yeah. But you know, when it happens ten times or more, then you're really thinking, "Whoa, what's going on here?" You know. So this tink stuff is pretty nasty. Um, Steven says, yeah, likely the uh, co-anal swab isn't picking up the tink. Uh, it's not being shedded yeah. that way reliably. And, and, and that makes a lot of sense. You have the animal. You can do a PCR of organs. Yeah, that's to me, would increase the chances of detecting it. Um, Aaron, and, and everyone, tink is it's a real serious concern for anyone keeping turtle well, tortoises and box turtles um, at this point. Um, if you have any questions for Aaron specifically about Tink, please do put it in the chat and, and we'll try to answer those the best we can. But let's talk about coccidia more broadly. What is a coccidia for those that haven't studied parasitology? Well, it's it's a parasite that can have pretty complex, uh, pretty different complex, different life cycles. Um, broadly, you you will um, ones that people will often know of is like toxoplasmosis that you know you that you could uh, that maybe a, a cat could carry and um, it excretes it in the feces, and then when you're changing the litter, you inhale. Uh, some of those particles and they go into you, into you and then into your lungs. And then perhaps if you're pregnant or if you're immunocompromised, you might have some kind of um, immune system problem from that. Um, but generally, by and large, it's benign to humans um, for, for, uh, to, to the extent that I, I remember from the textbook. Um, on the other hand, where you have uh, the coccidia that is from the, uh, I, th- I, if I'm getting the, the name right, Amiridae, the, the family that's Amiridae, which includes uh, a lot of the, um, the, the coccidiosis that will cause everything from like gastrointestinal issues in chickens, or it could cause it in, in your dogs. Um, but in general, it's a parasite that, um, is able to spread typically through the feces um and then the the infectious particle in that case is the oasis and uh there is a point where it's not necessarily infectious and then it will uh turn into more of an infectious state uh and it can then potentially stay in the environment for maybe 12 months uh depending on how favorable the environment is for it one one uh oasis probably isn't going to cause an infection because a healthy immune system in an animal is probably going to be able to destroy it uh but the problem happens when you uh have a whole load of those oasis um along with 
potentially a compromised immune system, uh, which could be due to stress. It could be due to uh, an issue of the animal itself. Um, uh, but one interesting thing on the toxoplasmosis is that there's another state that the um, parasite can remain in, which is uh, called the, uh, the cyst, or I believe it's also called a bradyzoite. And it's where it can go into a completely um, quiescent form. And the medications that work against the pathogen when it's active don't work on it when it's in the quiescent form, when it's oh. in the dormant form. So um, there's no proof of that occurring with tink. But if it were to happen, that is one hypothesis of why um, you could treat the animal and cure it, but then they're cured of all the active forms, but then there could be some inactive particles that could say, oh, hey, I'm, I'm awake again and I'm going to kill you, you know. That, that but is that, that's still, horrible. Hypothet still hypothetical. <laughs> yeah. um, and th this is something that both Aaron and I are working with and managing in our collections. In 20, was it, I think it was the fall of 2018, uh, I decided uh -huh. to take on a group of Holmes hinchback tortoises that had been treated for tink and about half their uh, enclosure mates passed away. And the remaining animals were treated and kept warm. Um, and then eventually uh, the, uh, the people that were caring for those animals decided not to care for them anymore. And I decided to take them on. And those animals that were treated have been rock solid for me. They've lived for five years in my care. Um, the females produce eggs every year and I consider them to be quarantined for life. But yeah. as a group, they are doing well, they're healthy, uh, even though half their enclosure mates passed away. So we're both managing it and, and uh, did, uh, you know, just taking care of this problem. Um, Aaron, How many animals did you yeah. say did die? Uh, I don't know. Uh -huh. I don't know. Um, I'm going to yeah. say there were like 10 to 15, and I mm -hmm. received five. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I, I had the survivors. Um, and so we talked about what a coccidia is. It's a, uh, it's a parasite. It's an uh, internal parasite. Um, coccidiosis is the infection of this parasite in a, in a body. Um, the T in tink is for testudines, which is another word for colonians. But let's talk about the intranuclear part, because I think that is uh, what is, so, some people uh, are curious, uh, you know, how can a parasite live inside the nucleus of a cell? Can it really do that? And what are the implications of that, Aaron? <laughs> based on your uh, knowledge. There are, um, be, beyond uh, Tink, I'm pretty sure there are some other parasites that can live um, in the nuclear part of the cell, um, but also it's pretty common in uh, some of the sexually transmitted um, infections hmm. that humans can get you know, that are bacteria. Um, I'm, I'm actually trying to think now if, if, uh, if chlamydia might be one of them. Oh. And I, I believe there's one other one that, uh, that, that's in there. The, I can't remember if the chlamydia, gonor gonorrhea and, um, uh, w one other, uh, but, uh, I, I'd, I'd have to look that up, but I know sure. at least one or okay. two, Interesting. um, it can do that. Uh, but of course, in that case, you're treating them with antibiotics. Um, you're dealing with a bacterium instead of a parasite. And in this case, with a parasite that has a really uh, rather complex life cycle where um, not only how it's reproducing, because there are different forms of reproduction that they can uh, do um, um, both by uh, well, 
without going into technical issues, which I kind of forget, uh, there, there are extra complexities with it. But the the the, the issue with pink being in the uh, intranuclear part of the cell, one of the questions is what level do you have to raise up the medication within a turtle or a tortoise that becomes effective to killing the parasite that not only might not be in the nucleus of the cell, the, the nu nuclear part of the cell, but other parts of the cell. So you're, you're having to deal with um, making where the medicine is high enough, where it's therapeutic in every spot, in every form uh, of, of the, the pathogen, or at least you're able to maintain that medication to that level until the parasite develops to become um, susceptible to it due to a certain life stage. Um, there, there's a possibility that certain parts of the life stage are more susceptible to it than other parts of the life oh. stage. Um, I, 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 I don't know on, on TV, yeah, yeah. but it, yeah. it's, pres it, it, it's plausible, mm -hmm. especially when you're able to have an animal that you're treating for 12 months and gets really good, has all, you know, it seems like it should be otherwise cured. And then all of a sudden, you know, uh, even while being on the medicine, goes downhill and dies. Sure and is. And then all of a sudden you start seeing other parasites that you never saw in it, like, um, uh, uh, or the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the fun worms that come out of the cloaca, the little yeah. white. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, that happened last summer with an animal. So there, there, there's obviously a lot of things that you don't, you don't know what's causing what, but yeah. It's, at at it's any rate, I, you, you need you need the medication at a certain level to probably kill out the, the pathogen in the nucleus. So I'll give you a little break. We'll reset. Uh, <laughs> welcome to the Two Turtle Tom live show. If you have just recently joined us, uh, welcome. We do this every Thursday night at 8 p.m. I bring on a guest to talk about uh, turtle care, turtle keeping, turtle conservation. And tonight we have Aaron Johnson. And Aaron has experience with the Bell's Hinchback Tortoise. And he is really the person that has helped us understand uh, why so many people are having such a hard time with the Bell's Hinchback Tortoise. And yes, there are other complications and uh, things associated with these animals, but we think that many are likely infected with what we call tink or tortoise or t uh, testidine, that means turtle, intranuclear coccidiosis, a uh, uh, coccidia that is a nasty parasite that has a fairly complex life cycle. Um, and it's a really, really difficult bug to treat. And if your tortoises, uh, if it's novel or new to a tortoise population, it can kill them uh, relatively quickly for sure. So that's what we're talking about tonight. And, and Aaron has some great uh, experiences with this. Um, and a couple more questions. So Valerie uh, Hayes, Valerie, good to have you with us. I haven't talked to Valerie in quite some time, um, but she says, is Tink known to infect aquatic turtles, Aaron? Most of the uh, and, uh, of the testidines that have been studied with this are actual tortoises, but I do believe that there have been some individuals of aquatic turtles. Um, and I don't see any reason why they wouldn't be able to, but if they're, if it's less likely, um, it may, you, you know, if, if you're finding it only in tortoises and you're not finding it in turtles, let's say you might be able to find it in, um, uh, a box turtle that is fully terrestrial versus a box turtle that is mostly aquatic you know, or semi-aquatic, um, it, it, it really might come down to uh, the way that the animal is able, the, 
the way the animal is taking it into its mouth and ingesting it. So um, with the with the tortoises being on land, um, they're able to defecate on land. They will go into their bowls of water, defecate in that. It won't be like a full aquarium full of water. It will be just in that that one area. Um, if if potentially uh, an animal eats it and it's in an infectious uh, state, well, there you go. You have it in the, the liquid form. You could get it spread on the food. Um, so um, potentially the terrestrial lifestyle might be more likely to get it than say uh, an animal that is swimming in water, you're giving them pellets or some live food. Um, and maybe the, uh, the, the, the actual parasite uh, itself is in a higher volume of water in that case, as long as it's not um, being uh, inundating the water to a high concentration within that large volume, you might have less of a likelihood to ingest the parasite. Yeah. So more volume, probably better, more space, um, if, if you're terrestrial, probably also better. Uh -huh, it's, uh -huh. it's, but the less space and the, the less volume, the more likely you're going to pick up the parasite or pathogen. Yeah. That, 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 that's what I think. Probably. Some particle physics in there. <laughs> um, and, and so the big, big question about tank, uh, um, and it certainly can infect box turtles as well. So it's definitely crosses over to box turtles. It's not just tortoises. Um, has anyone detected tink in nature? Meaning in its geographic origin, is its geographic origin known or suspected? And I think this is the million dollar question, Aaron. And what do we know? Um, I There is one article, um, actually a science paper, where I believe that it was detected in I'm, I'm thinking it was actually a turtle um in morocco and yeah. um i would actually need to pull that up to make sure yeah. but that is the one case that i know of that that they that the, the researchers did think that it was coming out of the environment instead of being introduced once in captivity yeah. um and I know you and I have spoken about this numerous times that yeah. uh, yeah. we 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 uh, we 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 think it's uh, that that tink as we're seeing it must be endemic to Africa, potentially Madagascar, because um, uh, even historically um, the uh, Pixis spider tortoises, the Astrochelys uh, radiated tortoises had a lot of tink. Uh, when studied in captivity, at least in the United States. Um, I don't know if in Madagascar itself, um, but um, I, yeah, I, that, I mean, I, I totally yeah. agree with you. The evidence seems to point to an African origin. It's endemic there. Perhaps the tortoises and the turtles, uh, it's a normal part of their biology. But the species hasn't even been named yet. <laughs> the species of Caxiti right. uh, that's doing this. I mean, we, we, the only reason we know about this is from people uh, caring for captive turtles. Once again, another great example of how ex situ conservation work can help us understand wild populations of animals. But um, yeah, it's just, it seems to have this Africa origin. And what, what's interesting most tortoises from Africa that were being imported shut were shut down in 2000. So you can't bring in sulcatas anymore. You can't bring in leopards. You still can bring in hingebacks. And then, of course, uh, well, probably no tortoises from Madagascar are coming in, but they used to come in all the time. Um, so we we need someone to do that full blown study of tank in the wild and see if they can detect it. I agree. <laughs> yeah. so, all, so if anyone agree. wants to fund yeah. that, if anyone <laughs> wants to fund that, uh, it would be huge. So um, thank you, thank you, thank you, Valerie, for that question because it's a great one. Um, 
So does anyone know uh, why hingebacks are so badly affected by tink or other species devastated by it as well? I have some thoughts, Aaron, if you if you need a little break, uh, just to give your voice a little break. Um, I mean, I, I think it's, I think they, they probably tolerate it pretty well, but hingebacks are cheap tortoises. They're not well taken care of, at least traditionally they haven't been in the supply chain coming from the wild through the American pet market and, and uh, things like that. And so that puts them at um, just crazy stress levels. And, and so Aaron, let's talk about some of the associated problems and issues you're seeing with some of these Bell's hingebacks. Yeah, so if, if, you, if you don't have tink or if you don't have an animal that's doing poorly, I have like no problems with them. They're, they are, if, if they're a healthy tortoise, they're a healthy tortoise, they're phenomenally yeah. easy. Yeah. Um, um, and, th and that goes the same with uh, the, the Speaks hingebacks that I have that are captive bred. And then I have one uh, long-term captive pair of uh, Kinixie's uh, Homiana, the homeless hingeback. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, uh, they eat well, they, they're pretty predictable on when their behavior is, when they're going to breed, when they're going to eat, what they like, what they don't like, where they're going to like to hide, um, when they like to warm themselves up or sun themselves and when they don't, things like that. Um, but uh, for sure, besides the devastating issue of Tink, you're probably also going to, you're likely going to have, um, you know, well, if they're wild caught, they're, they're bound to have some sorts of parasites in them that aren't necessarily pathogenic. And as long as they're otherwise healthy um, and those parasites don't get overloaded in their gut, they're probably going to do okay with them. There could be, once you've had them fully established and they keep on having really loose bowels um, or say they're not holding their weight as well as they should, then it might be something where you would want to get them, um, you, you know, get their uh, a fecal sample anyway under microscope and see if they need something like Panicure or Metronidazole, uh, something uh, something like that. But then again, they may not need anything, and they they do remarkably well. Um, yeah. And um, unfortunately, yeah, there are a lot of other tortoises that. Uh, are known to have died from tink, uh, which are which any time I've spoken to um, experts on it, they always named the radiated tortoise, um, which that yeah. the very first study in the early 90s was on radiated tortoises yeah. in Florida. Um, and then, of course, um, the spider tortoises. Um, but then there are studies with them with the endotestudo uh, forstini or forstinii, the, the forstins uh, tortoise, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. presumably then elongata, travancore, uh, you know, mm -hmm, the, the, um, and there isn't, you, no one should ever consider that any species is safe from this or that any species is less susceptible to it. If, if, if it, if it's available and it's if the parasite's in a high enough concentration, um, you're probably going to end up with bad luck with it. You know, absolutely. Um, can humans get it? I would say a uh, hundred percent, probably no. Um, Hopefully but not. on the other, <laughs> um, I, I have to assume that it's not going to work with uh, human physiology or any warm blooded mammal. Um, you might not even be able to have this transfer to even other reptiles. I don't know of tink itself infecting like say snakes or lizards, um, gators, something like that, which, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, there are other parasites, uh, other types of bacteria, like for example, uh, Oswickia, Oswickiosis, uh, the disease that can, uh, which is a bacterium that can infect everything from gators to lizards uh, to turtles. Um, so, um, you know, there, there are certain, certain pathogens that can spread across different types of, of reptiles. Um, 
you could get um, pinworms, you know, from, sure. from turtles and tortoises and totally. stuff. Uh, but uh, I don't believe Tink is showing up in uh, uh, in any type of warm-blooded animal. But on the other hand, other types of things that are in these turtles or tortoises, you can get sick from. Don't cuddle with the tortoise. Don't cuddle with yeah. the turtle. Don't yeah. put it up to your neck. Uh, yeah. And or kiss it or anything yeah. like that. They, yeah. That is not safe. <laughs> um. Alan, we will talk about Aaron's Burmese stars in a bit. Um, we have a show and tell item. Uh, Ichiro uh, in Hawaii says that he is having some issues uh, with, that, with uh, his leopards in quarantine. He's got some sort of virus from one baby that already passed along with two stars and leopards. So um, Ichiro, we can help you get connected with the University of Florida if you are interested in doing some testing uh on those animals to see what it might be um and stephen is saying that tink is showing up in captive bred tortoises now at least on occasion now aaron if you could kind of answer that question what about babies from adults so that have tink yeah um i i would doubt it in most cases but I took up the protocol to once the eggs are laid from these females, um, which I believe I spoke in the video that I made for uh, TTPG. Um, yeah. And I basically, I just talked about how I wash the eggs in a very, very careful way. But um, yeah, I try to get all of any type of feces or, or soil off it. And then um, once they're incubated and once they hopefully hatch, um, once it's safe to get the baby out of the egg, uh, without tearing, you know, any of its soft tissues or anything like that, I will try, I'll, I'll try to separate it from the egg and, and gently wash it off with a little bit of water just to give it a little bit of a, um, extra care to prevent in case there could be, um, some of the parasites still on the outer eggshell. But um, there shouldn't be any mechanism for it to be transferred. Um, I guess the word is vertically, actually from the mother to the female, um, like from her into the egg during development. Um, I, I would have to imagine that it's, it's exceedingly likely, but um, if the eggs are really dirty and the t tortoises break out of them, you, yeah. you have a chance of the baby ingesting that yeah. and then potentially coming down with tink. I mean, I mean more more than likely, it, it's that that captive bred tortoise is going to get tink in the environment mm -hmm. that it's being raised if you have tink in your collection um, rather than direct, but certainly could happen. Um, Valerie is wondering if anyone's done the molecular work with tink to determine their evolutionary tree. As far as I understand, uh, maybe they are not, someone's working on it but uh no i mean we don't even have a species name for this coccidia from what i understand it's not been studied by microbiologists and uh, yet I, I, maybe hopefully someone's studying that but uh it's not been named they they do have a although i don't believe and unless it's happened in the last say six months or so um or i've missed it but on the other hand, uh, so although I don't think it's actually been named as a species, it is known on the uh, phylogenetic tree where you have the branches, the evolutionary yeah. branches, where you're having like normal um, uh, Amiridae type um, coccidiosis on, on this hand. And over here, you have uh, toxoplasmosis, uh, the, the taxoplasmidae, I guess is the, the family name. Um, where they are related historically well you have tink around here what they would call i think more of like a basal position a lower position of the evolutionary tree and the closest known relative to it that they have found so far is actually a coccidium that infects the ring neck snake wow. That's amazing. <laughs> so which which i uh yeah yeah i i think that's really really neat that uh but 
I, I actually don't know how path pathological that species is to the ringneck snake, nor if it's passed to other um, other snakes uh, in the environment. But um, I've never kept ringneck snakes long enough to know if there's any issues with them. But I've you know I've they're so cool. Found them in the wild, of course. <sighs> yeah. If someone has a tortoise that has been diagnosed with tink please describe to us what medications and the medication regime your tortoises have uh, that you've given your tortoises and then how long you've done that the first thing that you have to hope for is that the animal is still eating um, if the animal is still eating then you have a higher potentially a higher chance that you're going to have a better outcome. Um, so I used Ponazaril, uh, which is thought to actually kill the parasite rather than just slowing down its reproduction or its uh, and such. So with Ponazaril, I was doing 100 milligrams of the medication per kilogram of the tortoise. And usually... Um, 100 milligrams would come out with like say one milliliter of that's the medication yeah. it was something like that yeah yeah, yeah. and so it, it so it was very convenient so i was able to make it where like say um say the tortoise weighs 600 grams and i would give it like uh 60 percent of of the milliliter or the 10, 10 cc's um yeah. i would i would give it like that um I do that every 48 hours for at least three months. Every other day for three months. That's dedication. And then you go on another three months, potentially um, <laughs> like twice a week, you know, where, where you're, you're getting another day break from it. Um, and then if you can, you want to put it on food so that the animal just eats it you you spread it all over the food you don't give a whole lot of food at any get, given time and um in my case it was strawberry flavored and the hingebacks all liked it however if the animal's not eating then you have no choice but to try to stick it down the throat um and and that that for me that was a two-person uh scenario that my dad would help me with um every awesome. every two days That's um yeah. Then, then there was another hingeback tortoise that would not allow me to do that, and and she's alive, and she's actually doing really well now because finally she got to the point where she would eat the food regularly, and she would get the medicine regularly. Um, being able to get it at that perfect ratio on the food, you might have to end up adding more medication in order to do it because they're not going to consume all the food necessarily um but the key is to keep on sticking with it keep on sticking with it watching for them to hold their own if they start going down to a level where they're losing you know if they're starting to really lose weight and go down where okay they're not doing well at all they're so lethargic you might as well euthanize them because it's finally cruel to just let them waste away and it, it um, yeah, it's it, it's horrible We've yeah. both um, Patrick's yeah. wondering about um, gloves, and absolutely, you want to wear gloves. Patrick, if you watch the uh, replay, we, we talked quite a bit about uh, how to kill it, and it's, it's almost impossible. Um, lastly, success. What does success look like, Aaron? Tell us about what you've got cooking. So success with animals that have been treated. Um, I have a pair that I will now have had two years this March 23rd. Um, wow. And that uh, those animals I treated approximately for a year and a half. And every other um, day. I finally, yeah, of first off every other day. And then finally it was about every, every three days. I got wow. it down to where it was like twice a week and I put on their food. Um, and these animals are housed separately in like larger stir -like containers. I have like a pee pad in there. Um, 
I put a top on it and that way I can keep some humidity in there because the humidity is just like it, it they're going to dry up and they're not going to do as well if you don't have that humidity if you can keep that humidity where it's you know 70 yep. percent hopefully something like that yes. uh those adult tortoises are going to do a lot better their skin's going to look better um you keep it where they're having you know at the lowest like 70 degrees in this case they might be getting up to 85 um in the summertime in this situation um you know like during the day at a peak and then go back into the the 70s for the night um but anyway in this case where i'm soaking them i'm getting rid of these disposable plastic containers once a week so that way they're not always ingesting uh whatever they defecate into and so you're just hoping that over the long run you can eradicate it um and uh, just keeping regular as regular as possible to keep them hydrated keep them fed keep them medicated finally i ran out of my prescription and it's been a year and a half of doing this and i said okay they're doing well they're stable i'm going to see if they maintain the stability um and that's where i am right now um it's only been about a week or two that oh, wow. they have been off the medications um but um if if they start getting sick again i would consider getting them on medications again i also would consider euthanizing them as well because long term i don't want to treat this species these specific animals for years upon years upon years it's yeah. very time consuming energy consuming and it's expensive uh at least yeah. 90 dollars. i'm spending at least 90 dollars per you know unit of, you know vial of medication um and it's just a lot of responsibility and finally you need the animal to be able to support itself how an endangered species where this is like this is it there's no other animals out there that are like this one well yeah you would want to keep on medicating them indefinitely if, yeah. if you had at all could um because could five years from now a new medication come around that could treat them and cure them or could you get them in a state where they're actually able to reproduce and lay eggs and those babies um you know are healthy so i'm i'm going to keep it open where i might treat them if they if they get sick again but if it ends up where it becomes where they're rapidly declining um i might have to say I'm really sorry for you guys, but I need to do what is humane for you all and focus on the animals that are healthy. You know, Absolutely. it's, um, I haven't concluded yet. It's to be determined. <laughs> yeah. Well, Aaron, you've talked to us about Chacos. You've talked to us now about the Bell's Hinge back and Tink. You also work with star tortoises. Tell us a little bit about your star tortoises and, and some recent events. So yeah, yeah. So recent events, um, I had I hatched out two healthy star Burmese star tortoises, uh, Giochalone uh, platinota, and I ended up having twins in one egg. Um, they did not do well. They did they didn't survive past the egg. Uh, one was very immature, and one was somewhat malformed. But I went ahead and preserved them in. Wow. Uh, in alcohol, this was the animal that was a bit bigger, but malformed. They were all connected to the same uh, yolk sac. Wow. And then this was the one that, if everything could have gone well for it, and maybe had, I, I kind of thought that she, that this little one probably needed another couple weeks. Uh, it was really pale. The, 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 the shell was very pale smaller a little bit more diminutive than all the other ones that hatched out um but yeah um what i did was i took about uh 91 percent isopropyl alcohol and injected it through a hypodermal needle into the the armpits of of both of the deceased the armpits and then also uh their groin area um and then um i injected it until their legs and their necks kind of start protruding. 
Um, and that was at the 90% range of isopropyl. And then I put them in a 70% isopropyl for long-term storage. Um, and I did this in maybe 10 minutes. It wasn't perfect, uh, but they are preserved now and they're holding up really well. Um, yeah. And uh, so this, this definitely sucked, <laughs> but... Um, still was pretty interesting to to happen uh but the, the the other two babies are doing flawlessly well um very active much more active than chaco tortoises are when they hatch out mm. uh, like these guys were just like oh i'm ready to rumble i'm ready to run around um yeah i'm gonna eat i'm gonna drink i'm gonna do everything the chacos are a little bit more uh usually are a little bit more shy a little bit more lethargic but yeah. they get there yeah, and, uh, oh, that's cool. And then the next ones that I should be hatching should be two, uh, two of the Bell's hingebacks. Any time between now and I'm saying early April, um, and I'm trying to cook some males with that. I am uh, incubating at um, between 84 Fahrenheit and um, 86 Fahrenheit. Um, there are some peak temperatures on the top of the shell where it might get up to 87, but I don't think that's the overall temperature. Um, and uh, yeah, I just have them on vermiculite in the lower to mid 80s. Um, I keep the humidity level anywhere between uh, 50 and 70, well, 60 and 70 percent relative humidity. Um, and then I will sprinkle water on each egg. Uh, twice a week uh, from a reservoir of water that's in the incubator. And I just do that just uh, to get the shells uh, moist. It works really well with Chacos. It worked really well with the Burmese stars. And so hopefully it will cool. work well with, the, with these uh, awesome. Meliana. And then I should have two more Chacos hatching out in April. Very cool. Well, you're doing a lot of amazing things, and the dedication you've shown to these Bell's Hingebacks, um, you you deserve those <laughs> eggs to hatch. That'll be incredible. Thank you. And we hope that it will just continue, and then we can have some animals in herpetoculture and start working on making F2s from those F1s. Um, I do still have my animal. Um, it's doing yeah. okay. It's doing okay. Um, I have I made the decision to not treat it, and um, I started out with three. I have one left, and she's doing okay. She'll go outside. She does much better when she's outside. Um, you know, I st I still think there's a lot of questions about these animals. They're still coming in. Um, Underground reptiles actually raised the price of them from $100 to $125, this last import, and they sold out. So for whatever reason, it seems there's a little more interest in them. I don't know uh -huh. why that is. Um, but as you can see, it's still very difficult. A lot of people have worked with these animals. A lot of people have had uh, large die-offs, and um, we all have had uh losses and it's it's been one of the most vexing uh issues in the tortoise world in the last couple of years but thanks to aaron and his dedication i think we are much further along so aaron thank you so much thank you everyone in the chat aaron is there anything uh you would like to uh say or leave us with um about your yeah. work I would one like to thank uh, some of uh, the people who actually helped me even to get these healthy animals um, like Al, Al Garrido, uh, he helped me out early on. Uh, Tanner Chowns helped me out with um, the, the, the ones that are actually developing right now. Um, Jeremy Thompson has helped me out uh, very much with, with, with the animals. Um, uh, basically, every person who made a positive impact in you know sometime after those animals got imported here and if those animals are still alive 
I'm grateful that those people came into those animals' lives and were able to make a difference to get them from point A to point B, C, D, E, because I'm the third owner of every single one of my animals. Um, I'm either the second or the third or the fourth owner. Um, you know, that that's a wow. lot of hands within the United States. Um, but every person who had them beforehand did a fantastic job. And those animals couldn't have gotten to me if it hadn't been for them. So um, the hard work, you know, is, is in the stream of every keeper who is diligent out there. Awesome. So thank you to, to everybody out there, whether, you know, you know me or if we don't know each other. Thank you for any hard work you do. Awesome. Yeah, that's right. You know, we can we can do the right thing and we can push her pediculture forward and, and really make a difference uh, as private turtle keepers. Um, and, and this is one of the ways we do it. Um, understanding and, and sharing and collaborating and uh, advancing the knowledge. So, Aaron, thank you so much. Uh, next week. Thank you. We are going to have uh, Dirk Barnard, who is from South Africa, and we are going to talk South African tortoises uh, next right. week. So be sure to uh, stop by next Thursday. And uh, we have a special guest host who likes to sell tortoise food uh, to put on top <laughs> of your your green. So special guest host and Dirk Barnard from South Africa. Uh, next week. So, Aaron, thanks so much. Thanks, everyone in the chat. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. And uh, we'll see you next week at Thursday, uh, Thursday at 8. Thanks, Aaron.